Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the annual general meeting for Hampshire Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. My name is Steve Erskine. I'm the chairman of the trust. Uh, really to kick off with an apology, because we really wanted to do the AGM this year in person. We had all the arrangements made for that. But you'll understand, you'll have seen in the press, and you'll, you'll probably know from our numbers that the COVID numbers have shot up over the last few weeks. Um, and given that the welfare um, of both yourselves uh, and everyone else is our number one priority, we had virtually no choice but go back to virtual working. So apologies, we'd have loved to have done it in, in person, we'd have loved to have done the showcasing. Unfortunately, events have uh, transpired against us. Just to remind people that we're recording this evening, um, if you don't wish to be in the recording, you've got two options. You could change your name on the screen, but we might still recognise you. Uh, what you can do also is turn your camera off if you'd rather not be in the recording. We are using closed captions as well, which allows people who are hard of hearing to be able to uh, follow the, the text on the screen. If you wish to take advantage of that, down the bottom of your screen, there's um, a button that's entitled Live Transcription. Click on that and you'll see the text coming across at the bottom. So who would have thought then that a year on from, my, from saying last year we'd had a terrible year with COVID, that we'd still be suffering the significant impacts that we are. Uh, and I said in my forward to the annual report this year that my thoughts are still with all of those families who've been affected by COVID, um, those people who've passed on over the last 12 months, all those people who continue to suffer. Uh, and here we are again, still suffering from the pressures that that brings into this organisation. And it's been, a, it's been a hugely challenging year for, for the Trust. You'll have, you'll have seen that if you've had a look at our information, you'll have read about it in the press. Um, it's not just Hampshire hospitals are under a lot of pressure. It's all of the organisations in the mm -hmm. NHS. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to pay tribute to all of our staff for the fantastic job that they do under the most trying of circumstances. Um, and I'd also like to thank, as part of this uh, introduction to our annual report and AGM, place a record my thanks to our, our executive and non-executive board members, our governors, many of whom are on the call this evening as well, and to all of you, I'd just like to say thank you because the work you do, work all our staff do, is absolutely incredible. Uh, delighted to be joined this evening by Alex Wickfield, who's the Chief Executive, um, our Exec and Non-Exec Board members, as I've talked about, and our Governors. And I'd like to formally welcome the Right Worshipful, the Mayor of Winchester, Councillor Derek Green. Quick counter through the agenda then. So um, Alex will start off with a review of the year. Um, that will pick out some of the highlights in our annual report. Um, our accounts were approved by the board and laid uh, before Parliament on the 13th of July, and they were presented to a full Council of Government meeting earlier on today. And information and a copy of that is on our website if you wish to see that. So Alex will do the review of the year first. We'll then have a, a responsive comment from our lead governor, Doug. We're going to do a very brief update on where we are with our new hospital program. And at the end of the, uh, the session, we're going to have a really, a really good session about designing our nursing future, led by Julie Dawes and some of our lovely nursing staff who are on the call. In terms of questions and answers, we'll stop at each of the segments. So we'll stop at the end of Alex's se uh, session, at the end of the new hospital update session, and at the end of the nursing session for Q&As. If you want to ask questions, you uh, can actually put them in the chat as well if you want to do that, and we'll try and respond to those. And all of the Q&A sessions will be uh, facilitated by our comms team. Uh, and as I say, if you want to put comments in the chat, then we'll respond as we go along as well. So that's about it for me. That's the introduction. Uh, and with no further ado, I'll hand you over to Alex. Alex. Thank you, Steve. And really lovely to see some familiar faces um, with us this evening. So as Steve said, our um, annual report has been um, laid before Parliament and is uh, published on our website. It is close to 200 pages, so I have done my best to summarise some key highlights from it for you this evening, but the whole thing is there for you to read. Um, and we will be publishing a, an, an easier read version of that in the next week or two. Um, so 21-22, well, it, it, as Steve said, it was a year um, we had hoped that COVID wouldn't characterise, but in fact it did. Um, despite that, I think our teams have delivered amazing things and actually delivered innovation and progress um, in spite of um, the operational challenges we face. So if we go on to the, fir the first slide, um, 
the principles that guide us are our values that, that spell the word care about being compassionate, accountable, respectful and encouraging. And this year we added inclusivity to our values as a wraparound for our care values, as a really uh, important um, statement about who we are at Hampshire Hospitals and what we aspire to be. We also, during the year, refreshed our strategic themes, um, our vision and our first strategic theme remains to provide outstanding care for every patient. We haven't changed that. That is still very much what we are here to do every single day. Um, our second theme is around making Hampshire Hospitals a great place That's to work for all the field. brilliant people that work you. in the NHS at Hampshire Hospitals. The third is about working together for our population, and that is our new theme. Um, but I have structured this review of last year, including that theme, because actually it reflects a way of working and just crystallises it into our strategic objectives. The fourth is about making the best use of our resources. Um, and many of you who have been to our AGMs over the last few years will know that usually our chief finance officer presents this section. Um, we're very sorry that Malcolm Ace has left us now. And so I'm going to pick up the finance um, section. But if there are detailed questions, I have finance colleagues on the call who can help to answer that. And then our fifth strategic theme remains around innovation. And this is about innovating for a sustainable future. So once I've just given you a bit of background to the year, I'm going to go through each of those themes and pick out one or two aspects. So we start with the people that we care for. So um, the people we care for live predominantly in the side of this map, although we do have some patients who travel from a lot further away to receive care in our hospitals. Um, but within this line, we've got around 600,000 people across Hampshire who rely on Hampshire hospitals for their hospital services. We run our services out of Andover, Basingstoke and Winchester hospitals, but also provide lots of care in community settings, people's homes, GP practices, Alton Community Hospital, Eastley Health Centre, Newbury Hospital and a range of other places. In terms of a breakdown of who makes up Hampshire hospitals, well, we have around just under 9,000 colleagues that we work with. Um, covering 30 medical and surgical specialties. And you can see on this chart some of that breakdown. You will see that the biggest number here is in nursing, midwifery and health visiting. And that's why it's so exciting that we're going to hear from some of our brilliant nursing colleagues later on this evening about you know, what nursing involves in 2022 and how it is developing over, over the years to come. But we also want to call out the, two, the more than 250 volunteers that we have supporting us. Um, and supporting all of our brilliant colleagues. But we're not just the employees, the, co the colleagues who work with us, we're also our Council of Governors, and it's fantastic that we're going to hear from Doug this evening, who is our um, chair, or our lead of our governors, our lead governor. Um, and we're really fortunate with the governors we have who represent um, you as the members and the public we serve. Um, but also our staff groups and some of the partners that we work really closely with. And it's been 10 years since Hampshire Hospital was, was formed in um, January 2012. And all this year, we've been celebrating that and recognising the people who make up Hampshire Hospitals. So looking at 2021 20 to 2022, which is the financial year, the year we're looking at in this annual report, you can see here some, um, some numbers that characterise the year. Um, one of the ones around our staff that I think is extraordinary is that we have over 90 different nationalities represented amongst our staffing groups. And we are so lucky with the diversity of colleagues that we get to work with every day. Um, our turnover last year was over 500 million. And one of the things that I particularly like is the WOW award system. And many of you, I know, have nominated colleagues and nominated um, staff at Hampshire Hospitals for WOW awards. We had over 3,000 nominations last year. And these, this is a system by which um, anybody can nominate any member of Hampshire Hospital staff. And in fact, other people as well. I was talking to someone from the Red Cross who works with us, who was nominated for a WOW award and how much that had meant to them. Um, but nominations because people have just done something brilliant. And then you look at our activity numbers. We've got over 8 million pathology tests. We've got over 130,000 people coming to our emergency departments. 
640,000 outpatient appointments, lots and lots of numbers, and 5,000 babies born in our hospitals or in um, home at home um, in 21 to 22. So I'm now going to go through each of our five themes and just pick out a few highlights from a very busy year. So the first theme is around how we provide outstanding care for every patient. And COVID was a real um, flavour of the year. Um, we were focused on how we could provide as much routine care, emergency care, cancer care, all the other care in the context of a, um, responding to a pandemic. Uh, one of the things we were really proud of was our response to the vaccination campaign. Um, we vaccinated lots of our own staff um, on several occasions, um, and we got to the stage where 94% of our staff had received all three of the COVID vaccine doses, which was amazing. But we also stood up a vaccination hub for the public um, in under four days from getting a call saying, is there any way that you could vaccinate the public? And um, we delivered over seven and a half thousand doses um, of the vaccine to the general public. But we also cared for over 2000 patients who were COVID positive in this year. So a lot of patients coming through. And as Steve said, the reason we're virtual tonight is COVID has not gone away. We are still caring for COVID patients today and over 150 in our hospitals for the last few weeks. Staying with providing outstanding care. Um, there's a lot of um, innovation and improvement from the team. Um, we expanded our mental health services. And this is mental health services within our hospitals. We have um, unfortunately um, seen an increase in the number of young people, of adults and of older people who come into our hospitals for physical health care, but also have a mental health condition alongside that. And we want to provide the best care we can for those people looking after all of their needs. And we've increased the staff and the teams who are able to wrap around those patients. Um, we've also um, got a new lead for patient support services. This is um, Billy, um, who is a bridge between the nursing staff and the estates and facility staff, making sure that we're really linking those two things together. We launched our clinical strategy and we stabilised our waiting lists and our waiting times, um, delivering over 90% of the elective activity that we had done in the pre-COVID year, which was really important to do. And then one of the statistics I'm most proud of is our cancer diagnosis standard. So Hampshire hospitals are one of the top performing trusts in the country for giving people the diagnosis. You, either you do have cancer or you don't within 28 days of any concerns, any referral from GP. And that's really important. And we managed to stay in that good position throughout the COVID um, time. But it has been challenging. Um, and in terms of the quality space, we have faced challenges around a CQC report on our maternity services just before Christmas last year, which um, rated us as requires improvement. I am delighted to say that our maternity colleagues have absolutely um, embraced the recommendations and got on with doing so many brilliant things um, uh, off the back of that report. Um, and it's really energizing to hear all of the improvements that are underway across maternity. Um, lots of those were estates related, our buildings are aging and um, lots of it was about repairing floorings and windows and sinks and such things like that. Waiting lists have been and continue to be a challenge. We make some progress, but they're not where we would want to be. The, the COVID impact on our staff has been a challenge. And as I say, our building conditions are a challenge. In terms of what our patients say about us, well, we get a lot of patient feedback and we take it incredibly seriously. I always think that the view a patient or a relative has of our services is a, a precious view that it's really difficult for us to see unless we ask, unless we listen. Um, and we've had over 56,000 people respond to a friends and family test. On the whole, um, most people rate the care they receive very highly, which is brilliant and is a tribute to our incredible staff who in challenging situations always put the patients first. But we also learn from those who have had a less positive experience um, and endeavor to improve for future patients. So moving on to our colleagues, our staff, we have an aspiration to make Hampshire hospitals a great place to work for every single person who works with us. Um, we want to provide a safe and supportive working environment. 
Um, and if I start in the middle here, we've set up a well-being hub. Um, we already had some kind of services around staff well-being, but I think COVID really um, crystallised the need to have a, a, a centre where people could call, they could go online, they could get really immediate help, whether it was just, I've had a terrible shift and I want someone to talk to, or, or actually, um, I, I want to access counselling for a prolonged period of time, or I really need to change my job, um, you know, how can I go about it or whatever. And our wellbeing hub has received lots of calls and they respond very rapidly um, to whatever the need is of the person on the other end. Um, we also, I think really importantly, have tried to keep our staff as safe as possible from COVID. And we had an incredible swabbing team that swabbed over 94,000 nurses, noses and mouths. Um, in order to give COVID results very rapidly to staff and to patients. And we do get lovely letters of thanks and compliments written to myself and Steve, alongside all of the wonderful cards and such like that go directly to our teams. One of the most important things for making us a great place to work is having enough colleagues um, in each and every team. And one of the things that I am really impressed with are uh, particularly our nursing colleagues and our HR and recruitment colleagues over the last year, is that we have managed to reduce our vacancy rates. And that's against a context across the country of really high levels of vacancy in nursing and midwifery. And our nursing and midwifery vacancy rates are now the lowest they have been in, in my memory. And that is an absolute tribute to all of the hard work of my colleagues. Um, it's also involved quite a lot of international recruitment and um, I take my hats off to those nurses coming to the UK from overseas in the middle of a pandemic and I thank them for, for doing that. And also to the teams that they work with in Hampshire hospitals who have made them feel welcome and supported in making that transition. Um, we have a really high number of staff and colleagues on apprenticeships, um, so 336 at the end of the year. Um, and they are from all sorts of types of apprenticeships. So lots of people doing health and care apprenticeships or nurse degree apprenticeships or very clinical apprenticeships, but also people in our estates teams, in administration roles and, and a wide variety of management and leadership roles. So really exciting that we've been able to maximize the benefit of the apprenticeship scheme. And we've done thing, things in the year like launch our map to management. This speaks to staff survey reports that people didn't always feel supported by their direct line managers. And I think a reflection from us in the, the senior team that that might be because we hadn't really trained our line managers and we hadn't supported our line managers to be the very best they could be. So map to management is a a training program which supports anybody who is a line manager to pick up the skills, the behaviours, the, the knowledge to really care for the staff that are their responsibility. And that's been really well received by colleagues. So moving to our third strategic theme, which is about working together for our population. So this is about collaboration. Um, and we have worked um, last year um, and continue to work really collaboratively with lots of different partners. Um, on here, you've got the University of Winchester, for example. Now, they um, we work collaboratively with them on things like their nurse training programs and their physio training programs but also in areas like research and the use of our library and a thing called the Global Health Hub, where colleagues can go and support um, health needs around the world. Um, so we have lots of positive relationships with the University of Winchester. In Andover, we've started building a new GP surgery where one of the practices in Andover will be moving into in the next few months. There's a thing called the Frailty Car, which is a collaboration between the ambulance service, the Southern Health, ourselves, and even social care, so that when someone falls, um, the car goes out and immediately can support that individual to stay well at home with all the right wraparound support. Virtual wards are amazing. We quite regularly have over 100 patients who are at home, but being looked after by um, our clinicians using virtual technology. And of course, the amazing Winchester Hospice, which opened during the last financial year 
thanks to the wonderful charitable fundraising of our community who raised all of the capital funds to open a 10 bedded hospice in Winchester. In terms of the finance slide, so in terms of making best use of our resources and what happened financially last year. So last year, the NHS funding regime was different from um, previous uh, events. So, so this is exceptional in the sense of the normal funding rules in the NHS didn't apply. We were funded to care for people during a COVID pandemic. Um, and as a result, you'll see from the chart at the bottom, our income increased by 9%. It doesn't normally go up that much. Um, our expenditure increased by just over 9%, 10% um, from the previous year. We also had quite significant capital spending funded by a mixture of our own internal um, sources, but also specific projects funded nationally and charity support. Um, so that's really exciting because it's enabled us to invest in all sorts of things. And I'll say a bit more about a couple of those on the innovation slide. Um, so we have seen continued growth in income and in expenditure, and we ended the year um, reporting to NHS England a break-even position. If you look at the annual report, you will see a 2 million deficit. That is a, a kind of accounting treatment of some of the charitable funds that came in and such like. And I'm sure if people have detailed questions on that, my finance colleagues can answer. But effectively, we met our requirement to break even last year. So innovation, this is where some of our capital money went, but also where some of our, our brilliant innovative colleagues put their energy. So cath lab. So for anyone that doesn't know what a cath lab is, um, and I am conscious I have a cardiologist on the call, so forgive me, Dom, um, but effectively a cath lab, a cardiac cath lab is a sort of operating theater that's very specifically designed to do things with your heart, um, including looking inside your heart through angiograms and um, repairing your heart by putting in stents through angioplasty and a whole load of other things. And we have known for a while that the cath lab that we run at Basingstoke was old, getting to the end of its life. And also there were risks associated with having just one cath lab. You really need two to make sure that if somebody is having a complex procedure in the cath lab and then somebody else arrives with a heart attack, you're able to very quickly treat the second patient who's arrived. Um, and so we are building two new cath labs. Um, that, that is going really well on the Basingstoke site. And in the interim during the year, we brought in a temporary cath lab so that we would have two facilities available. It has enabled our wonderful cardiologists to treat patients in North Hampshire that previously would have had to travel much further afield to receive procedures. We also invested in a new Winchester pharmacy at the Royal Hampshire County with an amazing robot that automates dispensing of medications. Um, it scans barcodes and it knows that if you've been prescribed X, Y, and Z, it can scan a barcode and make sure that you're dispensed X, Y, and Z. It cuts down on any human error associated with dispensing. And it means our brilliant pharmacy colleagues can spend their time with patients and doing clinical reviews rather than checking labels on boxes all of the time. Um, so that's been fantastic. We launched our green plan um, last year, looking after our planet. Um, and I have lots of colleagues across the hospitals who are really um, passionate about carbon neutrality and our environmental impact. Um, and this has been a really engaging project. And we've also um, done a deal or got support from um, the UK Space Agency, who are working with us as part of our new hospital programme and other innovative um, ideas to work out how we can use some space technology to improve healthcare for the people of Hampshire. And finally, digital care. Our digital care programme goes from strength to strength. We have new digital systems coming online all of the time and refining our electronic patient record so that we move out of the paper age and into the digital age. So just a little bit about looking ahead, that was all what has been happening in terms of what is happening moving forward for the for 2022 to 2023. Well, you can read all about that in our trust strategy that we launched um, a couple of months ago. Um, the themes I've just taught you through, the values, as I say, have stayed the same, but with inclusivity as a, a wraparound. Um, and our vision remains providing outstanding care for every patient. 
Um, the digital investment continues and improving how we use digital technology and our focus on elective activity. Elective activity is all the planned work we do. So the hip replacements, the knee replacements, the cataract operations, all of the things that aren't life urgent, life threateningly urgent, but are so important. And we're working really hard to improve um, our productivity and our opportunities. It is thwarted by the number of COVID patients we're caring for because we cannot turn away a poorly patient and that, that sometimes comes into conflict with our desire to treat the planned patients. Um, we have got some exciting ideas about that, including um, the possibility of building an elective hub in Winchester, adding additional theatres and beds in order to protect that planned activity. Um, we are looking for support for a community diagnostic centre at Andover as part of the National Community Diagnostic Centre programme. That will increase the amount of scans and such like that we can do at Andover. Um, and we uh, signed a partnership agreement with GE last year, um, which um, replaces all of our imaging equipment, our CT scanners, X-rays, ultrasounds and so on. Um, but actually, from our perspective, the partnership is more than just about replacing kit. It is about how we tap into the expertise of a global diagnostic company to help us get the best out of our diagnostic um, services and our diagnostic equipment that we have. We know that this year the funding regime is very different. We have a really challenging financial ask in 22-23. Lots of the COVID support funds aren't there anymore, and yet we are still managing um, high numbers of COVID patients and during the last few months, high sickness absence in our staff as well. So we know the finances in the coming year are really challenging and that's taking a lot of our focus as well. And then of course we have our new hospital program um, and you're going to hear more about that from some of my colleagues later so I won't steal their thunder, but suffice it to say that that is moving forward um, and we are determined to make the very best of the opportunity we're presented with. So that is my whistle stop through the um, annual report. I've seen the chat's been flashing up, but I haven't, um, haven't read those comments. So I'm very happy to answer any questions or for my executive colleagues to um, answer as well. So Alex, so far you've got three questions. So the first one is, what are the plans to replace Malcolm Ace? Ah, right. So um, for July and August, our finance um, chief financial officer is Hugh Crunchy, who is on the call. I can see him on my screen. Others may not be able to, but I can see him. Um, so he um, is uh, he was Malcolm's deputy, um, supremely competent and is covering for those two months. And then um, we have a new chief financial officer whose name is Steve West, who is joining us. Um, he, he starts formally in post in September, but he is joining us in August to, in order to get a good handover and an induction. So we are all lined up to, if you can replace Malcolm, we are all lined up to, to get a new chief financial officer. Okay. The, the next one up is what are, is from Michael, is what are the examples of over 30 million capital investments planned over each of the last two years, please? Um, of, the, of the capital spends. So some examples of how we've spent the, the capital, I think, is that what that's asking? So, okay, so we haven't that. had, I don't think we've had any items that are individual items over 30 million, but the sort of things we've done are, are the pharmacy in Winchester, that was a big capital project, the hospice in Winchester, um, we replaced um, a very expensive um, scanning machine, nuclear medicine scanning machine in Basingstoke. And then unfortunately, quite a lot of our capital every year goes on fairly boring building maintenance. So we had to replace the roof um, of the Basingstoke tower block because it was leaking onto the children's wards in G4. We've replaced all the electrical or some of the electrical substation works in Winchester and in Basingstoke. We, we're doing work on the sewer pipes in Basingstoke. Um, out at Andover, we've um, uh, refurbished the maternity outpatient area um, and we've built put in a new CT scanner out at Andover. So it's a whole combination. That's just a flavour of some of the things we've been doing. Sure thing. Uh, so Joy, I've seen you've got your hand up. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Hi Alex and Steve. Um, I just would like to thank you for um, clinical and admin staff for all of their hard work through this last year. We as patients really appreciate it. Also the teams leading the planning for the new hospital. I 
think you all worked so amazingly hard. And I just want to say thank you. Well, thank Joy. Am I allowed to say a thank you back to you? So for anyone on this call that doesn't know, Joy has been a volunteer at Hampshire Hospitals for over 40 years now, I think, isn't it? And we absolutely appreciate all that you've done for a long time, Joy, for our hospitals. Thanks, Joy. So Alex, next up, we've got a question from Tadley2022. Please, could you say a bit more about the partnership with the ambulance team and our response times? What has gone well and not so well in our region? And a second question, uh, very similar, is asking about the national discussion around surgical hubs aiming to reduce waiting times and any views on what's happening in our region as well. So I can answer those, but John Haynes might be um, in the best place to answer those. Sorry, John, I probably should have uh, pre-warned you, but ambulance, the work with the ambulance service and yes. Yes, yeah, so thank, thank you, Alex. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure most people are aware ambulance handovers and delays are quite a really big topic across the whole country at the moment. So um, we work very closely with our ambulance trust colleagues and partners to make sure that we can take and take off the patients and give them to our ED departments as quickly as possible as we can. This is really a challenging sort of thing at times, but we remain very focused upon it. Just today, actually, we started a brand new experiment in our basis of ED, where we sort of increased the RATIN capacity. RATIN stands for referral access and treat, referral triage access and triage where we effectively put more space in the front door to take those patients off the ambulances, assess them, treat them quicker, and process them through the departments. It's been one of the really big challenges we face, but we really are focused on trying to turn those ambulances and over over as quickly as possible. Just on the elective hubs, Alex, so the work we are doing on Winchester is one of our elective hubs for the regions. So we are, you know, we have got through the first stage of a process and we are now under Julie Masquerie's leadership putting a bid of proposal together and just completing our outline business case for the next stage of that. That is really, a really good project. We've got full support from all our partners across all the other acute trusts across Hampshire and otherwise, and we're working very collaboratively and collectively to, to develop and design a facility which will probably have four theatres and two wards and can probably have enough capacity to half the hips and knees required across all of the Hampshire Island wise and to do half and to do a significant amount of ENT and urology work. So really exciting project and again it shows some of the um, collective can do working together attitude of Hampshire hospitals that we've been chosen that and we're working very closely with our partner trust across the parish to try and deliver that. Thank you, John. Uh, so the next question is from Steve Tanner on citizen and sort of engagement and participation and what will be different next year. So Steve, I know that'll come up quite heavily in Mo's. Alex, is there anything you want to cover off here or do you want to pick it up at a later stage? Well, I wondered whether Julie could talk about some of the work we've been doing about um, patient engagement and the patient engagement forum and some of the work that's happened in the last year around that and the plans to increase that. Perfect. Sure, Alex, thank you. Um, so, um, and I think Jane's on the call as well, Jane Davis. So we've been working really hard at trying to get to the point where we um, have true co-production, where essentially everything we do as a hospital, we link within partnership with patients and the public, families and carers, right from getting feedback to designing our services, to um, be people being in true partnership with us around their own care and around how we deliver services. Um, we've got a um, couple of new members of, of Jane's team who've got a particular expertise in this. Um, our lead person who's just joined us from the local authority, who's done a lot of work dealing with members of the community, etc. But we've also done deep dives. We work very closely with Health Watch, um, and they. Um, so we take the opportunity to take as much information as we can to look at what patients are saying about our services and what wants to change. And internally, um, we've got a number of patient partnership groups. I think I've seen Frankie on the call who runs our cancer partnership group where we try to link with active users, um, to, to, with people who are having current lived experience to advise us on what that feels like and what we need to do. In addition to that, we have just, the trustees have very kindly supported us putting in some patient leaders, and we're hoping to have a lead director role who will be a, 
a, an expert patient. So really trying to get to that point where we're working completely in conjunction with our with our patients and public to you know so that we design services in response to what they want. Thank you, Julie. Uh, the next question I'm, uh, for everyone on the call, I'm just going to keep going in them in chronological order, so it's fair. And any we don't manage to get to you tonight, um, we will pick up uh, in a, offline in another format. So, Julie, the next question is about the CQC report, saying that it, it wasn't so great. Um, now it's behind us. How do we keep visibility on the progress we've made? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think we'd say we, we don't consider it behind us, actually. Um, I mean, obviously, we were really, really disappointed. It was an incredibly difficult time when the CQC came in to visit us, but we absolutely accepted the findings. And we've been, as Alex said earlier on in her presentation, we have been working really, really hard to respond to that. So in the way you could see some of the, uh, the, the, the bits around that, in our public board, we have a section on safe staffing, and that was one of the things that the CQC raised with us. They didn't feel we had enough staff on duty. You will see a section in our safe staffing report that reports on midwifery safe staffing. And I'm really pleased to say we've had a really, really successful recruitment, um, recruitment phase for midwives and continue to do so. We have a weekly um, CQC action plan. And so many of the actions have been acted, but we are keen to keep that going to make sure we've got sustained improvement and I'm really pleased now that the maternity services have got a continuous improvement a quality improvement plan that looks takes all the kind of national guidance national transformation and puts it into one plan and you will see some of that in our public uh, our public rep uh, governance report so you can see some of it there but of course we the most important thing to us is what our mothers and and uh, partners have to say about our services and again you will see that reported and overall we do continue to get a very very positive response um, from people who use our services. So we are absolutely not complacent. We are subject to external regulation actually around this as well. So we do have to repeatedly report on our progress on this. And at some point we would expect we'll have a revisit of that. And we hope at that point that we might get our grading uh, upgraded again to, to good. So uh, lots of really, really good work there. Uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, so the next two questions both relate to the, I, I think, to the new hospital, hospital programme. So from Tadley 2022 and uh, S. Reed. So Tadley asks, could you advise one of the trusts to take any of you on a larger scale rebuild if patching the existing build stops being the most appropriate way forward? And to which S. Reed extends, the delays to the new hospital programme seem very long. Are the people who don't want it succeeding, su succeeding in stalling it? So I wonder, Elliot, given we're hearing from our new hospital yeah. program team next, should we hold those questions to them? It, it, except just to say, it's not stalling. We are moving forward. It's just a long process, but maybe we see whether those questions still stand after the next presentation. Thank you. And I believe I missed one actually, so apologies. That's a Keely. Uh, what other mental health support will be offered to young people and adults? Uh, Julie, if I can come back to you for that one. Yeah, um, so this is uh, this is an area that we continue to work on and take it as one of our absolute priorities, actually. And I, so I think um, there will always be children and young people who come into our hospital who are having an, having an assessment or a diagnosis and some initial treatment. And it's really important. We've got a CAMS liaison team. We're increasingly um, upskilling our pediatric nurses to be able to feel really confident and competent in caring for young people with mental illness. However, we do also know that we, um, at the moment, do have patients who often stay with us too long when they should be in other settings. And what we do there is we continue to work with our partners, particularly those looking for tier four beds, um, particularly for children with uh, eating disorders, to work in partnership to get the right model and get those patients transferred as quickly as possible. We do this year have a plan to um, do some work to our estate. So um, we are aware that the paediatric wards in particular are not always the most, the, the most well designed for a, a young person with mental illness. And therefore we are having two uh, rooms designed on each side that will better accommodate the, the, the kind of safe needs of those children in our care. We've just got a new mental health nurse. So we, we lost Adam Smith, who was brilliant. Um, and he's gone to Southern Health, but we're really, really lucky that we've got a new mental health lead nurse called Priscilla. And her background actually is she is a specialist in uh, children's uh, adult, uh, children and adult and adolescent mental health service. So again, we're hoping to get a lot of expertise for her. So this this really does remain one of our key priorities for the for the next twelve months. 
Thank you, Julie. So next is from Frankie Webb. Is there any news on the replacing Wessex Ward? Julie, I think this is still you, if that's right. Um, well, Ben Creswell is the Divisional Director for Including Cancer, and he is on the call, although he, he is on his phone. So I, I've suggested perhaps he might be able to respond to this. If your phone is working, Ben. Yeah, no, it is. I, I'm thanks, Alex. I'm really sorry. I'm up at a meeting in Leeds, so I apologise for the background noise going on at the moment. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, the Wessex team have been amazing um, through COVID, and we, we've purposely moved them to some safe locations on the, on the advice of the infection control team, uh, and they're currently lodged on Candover Ward, which is our um, private patient facility, um, taking up some of the beds there. Um, so at the moment, what we're, what we're working through is um, potential options for either a refurbishment or, or potentially a new build ward for them that will enable them to have um, up-to-date ventilation um, for, the, for the newer specification for the work that they want to do, and then potentially also allow them to expand their services um, and develop some new um, potentially treatments uh, within, within, that, within that environment. So there are a few options um, and it's a question about whether we repurpose some of our existing real estate or essentially provide them with some new space um, on, on the Basingstoke site. Thank you Ben. So next question I have is from Jane. So Jane, since it's on nurse recruitment, I'm going to hold it over until Julie's presentation later in the talk if that's all right and go on to the next one. So Alex, one for you about the green strategy. Does our green strategy embrace lighting electricity? In particular, the example cited is to do with uh, patient comfort and experience and unnecessary stress. So our green strategy encompasses lots and lots of areas and absolutely lighting will be part of that. But I think this is suggesting about um, patients on the ward and some of the lighting in some of our wards and causing um, stress and distress to patients. Um, so I think if there are specific wards and situations, then Paul, please contact us afterwards and, and be clear on the specifics. Um, the um, lighting element of the green strategy is about replacing light bulbs with low energy ones. We've done quite a lot of that already, but there's still more to do. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure this will solve the particular problem you're raising and we need to make sure that what we're doing is sorting that problem. So I think that may be something we just want to take away to make sure we are fixing the problem. Uh, thank you, Alex. So uh, next question I have is from Chris Cornwell on his, he has a role on a local patient participation group at a GP practice and has concerns over the discharge process, including whether we're discharging with sufficient information or medication. Alex, who would you recommend for this one? Do you think John or Julie could both be good for it? Or Ben for that matter? And if Lara was here, she'd love to answer this. She'd definitely take it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, do you want to talk about, I mean, this is not, if we get specific examples, send them in. But yeah. in general, do you want to talk, Julie, about the discharge? Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I, you know, so I, and as Alex says, if there, we've got specific examples, um, I am aware of a couple, actually. Um, so, you know, normally we have a really robust process for making sure that a discharge is planned at an early stage, that all the medications, dressings, etc., is, is accompanies that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have to say that I would accept that at the moment where we've been trying to get that balance between, you know, trying to accommodate patients needing to come into hospital, they might be sitting in ambulances, we've had to sometimes compromise on some of the um, uh, patients discharge. So, so there have been a couple of occasions where if the TTOs have not been ready, they've followed on afterwards. Now, I'm not aware of some of the things you write in your report there, but it may be an interpretation of it. So, you know, we, uh, as I say, there, there's been a couple of examples where in order not to hold up the discharge, we've sent, we've, we've transferred the patient and then the medication has followed afterwards. Um, I certainly wouldn't be advocating and I'd be really concerned to hear that we've just said people to contact their GP. We would take responsibility and make sure that that's continued. But if there, as I say, if there are individual examples, really happy to hear about those and follow those up. We haven't generally had massive um, amount of complaints related to discharge, so it's not a theme that particularly I'd recognise, but, but I do know that obviously with the pressures on the hospital, there may have been a couple of slip ups there. So, thank you, Julie. Um, I think we're going to have to move on to our next presentation, so I'll ask one final question and then I'll, I'll move it on. So it's from Steve Turner and it's how are we collaborating with the ICS 
what should we be able to see that is different to show citizens are benefiting from this reorganization? Uh, so well, both Julie and Alex. So Alex, do you want to come back to you? Yeah, so um, so the, the we've been working together with our partners for years in different ways. So this isn't like a sudden cliff edge where we weren't working and now we are. But I think it does give us more of a statutory framework to try and do the right thing for our population um, and not let organisational barriers get in the way. And, and one specific example I would give would, would be that the, the ICB, the Integrated Care Board, that's the organisation across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, the first meeting, the first proper meeting really was last week. And one of the subjects was children and adolescent mental health services. And this is a, a, an area that covers acute hospitals, it covers community providers, mental health providers, social care providers, the voluntary sector, and a number of other people. And I think, it, and it's an area that we know demand has been going up hugely. It was going up before COVID, it's gone up even more during COVID. And I think we would all say that we are not serving our young people as well as we would want um, in the way we are working collaboratively to support young people in mental health crisis. So, so I think that is the kind of issue that the ICS will give us a different platform to try and tackle across um, all our organisations and do the right thing for the population. None of these problems are going to be quick to solve. So don't expect all oh, the ICS came into fruition on 1st of July, everything's fixed by October. These things will take time um, to do, but that's an example. But Julie, has been brilliant at being our chief nurse and also the chief nurse for the shadow ICS. So Julia, have you got any final thoughts on the ICS? You're on mute. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Somebody had to do it. Um, uh, no, uh, well, only to say, I think really, we're only just starting to see the benefit, aren't we, um, Alex? And we had the first board meeting. I think it was, you know, already there was a really different feel to it. The fact that people are really, really wanting to, get, to work together in partnership. And I, I think it would be fair to say that what it looks like now, and, and Isabel, I know, is doing a lot of the work in the transformation. She's on the call. You know, what it looks like now and what it looks like five years, we'll, we, you know, we recognise will be very different. A lot of this is about building working relationships and understanding how we can work together as partners but I actually feel really really excited about the prospect of what this can bring and and I think you know though it does feel even on that very first meeting we got some really important big conversations on the table children and adolescents was one was one of them actually um, and, and I think Liz Kirkwood's on the call as well so about how we engage with the community and, and patients problems so really important conversations I thought were reflective of the priority on the very first board meeting. Thank you both. Uh, so Steve it's back to you for our next agenda item. Thanks Annette just can you just confirm questions that we weren't able to answer there then we will go back to all of those people. Yeah. Because I'll keep ready. going sequentially for the next one and we will yeah, pick yeah. Them up. And if we don't get to them we'll pick them up afterwards and I'll put some, some of them and some of them we partially answered didn't we so we'll go back to those as well. Okay so next item on the agenda uh, is just a short response from our lead governor Douglas Ralph. Uh, thanks very much Steve. Uh, good evening everybody. Um, I just simply wanted to say, wow, uh, what a fantastic sort of whistle stop show uh, of what the outputs of the trust have been over the last uh, annual period um, against some incredibly challenging odds. Um, and I, it's a bit deja vu for me because I remember saying last year that I was never cease to be amazed by the commitment uh, and compassion of all of our staff. Well, a year on, we're still seeing the monumental sense of duty that is shown every day by our clinical staff, our support staff, our facility staff, everybody from those that manage the car parks to those that manage the trust uh from the ball down uh and i certainly would like to on behalf of the governors um thank all those staff for that commitment um it is truly amazing uh and we never cease to uh be sort of overawed by it um i would also say that by the interest that's being demonstrated in the questions there are a lot of people out there who clearly have uh, a keen interest in how the trust is run, 
how it sort of operates and the <clears throat> quality and capability of the services that it actually delivers. Um, the best way for you to actually do that is to come along and stand for election and actually become governors yourself. And then you will be at the very tip of the spear as far as actually sort of uh, having your voice uh, be heard uh, at, the, the, at every stage of planning and strategic delivery of this fantastic trust and the wonderful service that it actually uh, provides. Finally, I would also like to thank uh, all of the many volunteers that come along and actually sort of provide a service for us, uh, the members of our trust, and of course, indeed, the public who have been incredibly supportive to us over the last sort of 12 month period. Um, and thank you very much for all of your, your help. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Doug. That's really good. Um, and uh, thank you for those words of thanks to our staff, which is so important. So we're going to move the agenda on now. We're going to have a moment on Mo's. Uh, I think we've got Isabel, Sherlene and Dominic. Not quite sure who's going to lead off first. I'm up first, Steve, and hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can, Don. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dominic Kelly. I'm a consultant cardiologist at HHFT. Um, this is really important. I've worked for the NHS now for over 20 years and I've worked at HHFT for, for nearly 10 years. And I have no doubt that this is the most important thing that will happen in my career, uh, probably my life. And it really is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to get healthcare within North and Mid Hampshire really, really excellent and, and the best in the world. So. If you don't listen to anything else I say, I would just urge everybody to get behind this. So wh whether you're a member of staff, a board member, patient, relative, commissioner, media, I really do implore you to get behind us, help us create something that really could be wonderful for our population, for our healthcare, and, 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 and for generations to come. We could move the slide on, please. And again. So just to give you a bit of background, we were named as what was then called Boris's New Hospitals a number of years ago. And th thankfully that term has changed now and it's now known as the New Hospital Programme. But the New Hospital Programme is aim aiming to deliver 14 new hospitals across the country. And we are named as one of those hospitals. And as part of that, we were given uh, about five million pounds in seed funding to help develop our plans for this. Uh, and that is something that we've been doing over the last few years. Why do we need to do this? Well, as part of the extensive documentation that we've developed part of, of the uh, Hampshire Hospitals programme, uh, we've come up with what's called our, our case for change. And, and that focuses on four key areas. The first area is about our population and anyone that lives in Hampshire or drives around Hampshire will realise that there is a massive increase in our population happening. Everywhere you go, there is new houses being built and we need to provide healthcare for those people as our population increases. But probably even more important, we're coming into a, a phase over the next 10, 20 and probably 30 years where we have an increase in our more elderly population. So we're getting to the stage where the people where, where there was a, a boom of births after the Second World War are now getting into their 80s and 90s. And of course, those, those people are in a more vulnerable age. Healthcare requirements have increased and therefore the demands on our hospital will increase exponentially. Uh, and disproportionate to our actual increase in population. We also talk about clinical sustainability, and, and that is about recruiting the right people, be a, being appealing for people to want to come to our hospital, embracing new technology to deliver that high quality health care and develop high clinical standards. As you've already heard from Alex and a few other people, the condition of our buildings is challenging to say the least. All of our sites have been around for a number of years now. The cost of upkeep of those buildings is exceptionally expensive and the potential cost to, to, if you wanted to refurbish these buildings would be astronomical. And then finally, we talk about financial resilience and, and that is not about cutting costs. That's not, not a term that comes into my vocabulary. What that is about is making the most of the money that we have available to us because the NHS funding is not a bottom of the pit. And as, as a clinician, 
as an employee of the NHS and as a population, we have we 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 have a responsibility to use that taxpayer's money as appropriately as poss possible and as efficiently as possible. If you could skip on to the next slide. So, what are the priorities for our clinical models as we develop this new hospital? Well, I think I think the first thing to say is that although the money is for a new hospital, we're using this as a springboard, if you like, to not just build a new hospital, but to re invent the whole way we provide healthcare across the whole of Hampshire. So this is not a program that's just HHFT. We are very much involved with everybody that is involved with healthcare within Hampshire, whether that's people from the, the commissioners, the ICS, ICB, our partner organisations, Southern Health, South, uh, South Coast Ambulance Service, Southampton University Hospital, all these people are involved so that we develop not just a hospital, but a whole way of developing uh, and all delivering, sorry, healthcare across the patch. And one of the really nice things from my perspective, working within HHFT is that our board and our senior management uh, team really do, I don't know. really do listen to our clinicians and the people delivering healthcare on, at the grassroots. Because I believe that by developing a hospital with our clinicians, that is the best way to provide healthcare for, for our patients. And then in, in turn, we've also involved a, a vast amount of other people, patients, uh, et cetera, in the development of this. So we're gonna focus on population health management, trying to prevent those patients needing hospital care in the first place. One of the things that comes up all the time is that patients want to see integration of care. So patients do not want to be having a test in X part of Hampshire, but the person in Y part of Hampshire isn't able to access those results, doesn't, doesn't, the, the, the care doesn't flow. So we want to be able to provide integrated care so the patients shouldn't really know who's providing the care, whether it's HHFT or Southern Health, et cetera. They should just know that they're having health care and the next person that they see will know all about that. We will be centralizing some of our more acute services because if you are acutely unwell, what you need is to be able to see the most experienced and the most appropriate person as soon as possible. So bringing all those people together on a single site will allow us to do that. So if you are acutely unwell, you will see the right person at the right time. But we do recognize that when patients get over that initial more acute illness, they might need a period of rehabilitation or recovery. And what we will be aiming to do is provide step down beds more local to home so that patients can go recover, rehabilitate before going home. We'll also be offering what's called step up beds. So that is beds for patients that need to come in hospital, perhaps to be monitored a bit more closely, but, not, but, but are not acutely unwell. So don't need that immediate expertise and can go to one of the other sites providing more uh, holistic, but uh, um, close to home care. Maternity care is going to change across the whole of the NHS. You may have heard of something called the Ockendon Report, but a number of issues means that maternity care is going to change across the whole of the UK. And our really excellent midwives and obstetricians have, have embraced this and maternity care will change. Maternity care will be more focused on uh, on the people and putting them at the heart of the services. And through this process, we will be able to offer mothers who are expecting babies uh, a larger choice of not just where they deliver their babies, but how they deliver the babies and, and what services are there to support that. Neonatal care for those more vulnerable babies that are born prematurely also will be changed. And that is so that we can provide the service for those premature babies within our region. What we don't want is for those precious few weeks of your premature born baby to be spent in hospitals elsewhere, either within the region or sometimes even elsewhere within the country. So we need to be able to provide that expertise locally. And by bringing our neonatal services together, we will be able to do that in a sustainable way. Likewise, we've heard about pediatrics and young adults already. Very different uh, to dealing with adults. We need to provide the right environment for, the, for these young adults and children. Walking into a hospital is intimidating, is scary, and we want to build a purpose-built unit for, for young people. And we've been involved with the guys at Older Hay in Liverpool who've, who've developed a fantastic children's hospital and, and we're, we're working with lots of people. One of the things that affects us quite a lot uh, is what's called winter pressures. And that means when patients become more unwell in the winter months, 
our pressure on acute beds becomes greater. Now that winter pressures is now becoming spring, summer and autumn pressures, admittedly, but we still have these problems of variations in acute care. And what tends to happen is that during those periods of pressure on acute care, we tend to have to use up beds that are otherwise planned for planned operations. So your hip operation, et cetera, et cetera. And the result of that is operations get canceled. So by separation of emergency stuff and planned stuff, geographically, then that will allow us to ring fence those beds so that if your planned operation is in February and March, you'd be certain that that's not going to be cancelled due to bed pressures. Outpatients and diagnostics will continue everywhere. And you've heard Alex talk about the number of sites that we offer services. They will continue as, as they are. But what we want to do is make them more efficient because we have patients that are coming on a Monday for a blood test, on a Wednesday for a scan, the following Thursday to see somebody else and, and then a week, a week later to see their consultant. And that's that's not an efficient use of, of that individual's time. It's not eco-friendly, et cetera. So what we want to do is slicken up that process and provide what's called a one-stop shop. So you'll come for your test, your blood test. You will have a consultation with your consultant. You will have a management plan in place, et cetera, et cetera, all in one go. And that's what we aim to provide. And then, of course, the Cancer Treatment Centre has always been one of our plans and remains as, as, as such within the new hospital programme. So I'm going to move on now to Sherlene, who is presenting next. And I think Sherlene is going to talk a little bit more about integrated care and a few other things. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Dom. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Sherlene. I'm the Chief Strategy and Population Health Officer at the Trust. Uh, as Dom says, we have called this a Hampshire Together program because we are working with all our partners uh, in Hampshire and um, and again, the title modernizing our hospitals and health services means that we are looking uh, at, at the hospital, but also um, more broadly, uh, our health services uh, in partnership with um, uh, providers in health, social care, as well as our local authorities, uh, our patients, residents and voluntary groups. So um, in terms of partnership, um, we uh, have regular partner program group meetings. Uh, and uh, we make sure that um, we understand uh, the context uh, that our partners are uh, working in, for example, with local authorities, if they have local plans that are in development at the same time as we're developing our new hospital, we, know, we need to make sure that the plans align. So uh, those sorts of discussions take place uh, and our partners are actually part of our governance. So you will see there. Um, that we have refreshed our governance to make sure that our partners are uh, part of our program uh, as well. And not only are they part of the governance, they are also uh, uh, integral to our work streams and we work in uh, some level of detail with partners that you can see there um, uh, with our, our ambulance service, uh, with our primary care colleagues, um, uh, with neighborhoods and communities. Um, and we also uh, engage with different groups of patients as well as we progress with this piece of work, for example, in our integrated impact assessment, um, where we look at a broad range of, of topics like travel and access and inequalities and so on. So that is the uh, integrated um, uh, approach that we're taking um, and clearly now that the ICS is our statutory bodies, it makes it easier for us to do that. Um, the transition that took place was really supportive and um, we uh, managed to get um, uh, the, the, the handover from CCG to uh, ICS to support uh, our next stage of the program, which is to go to stage two assurance, which is one of the steps we have to take. Um, in terms of um, our uh, ongoing engagement. Um, we, we work very closely with the new hospital program. There, I think there are some questions in the chat there about delays uh, and so on. Um, the new hospital program team have been um, taking a program business case to Treasury. Uh, the initial 3.7 billion that was uh, announced when the program was first announced, um, as Alex is in the chat, is to cover what they call cohort one and cohort two of hospitals. So some of the schemes, uh, for example, the uh, Phil Carillion schemes like the Royal Liverpool Hospital are the ones that are included in that first tranche of funding. 
Um, and some of the smaller schemes that can be completed by 25 are the ones that are included in the 3.7 billion. The new hospital program team are taking a, a business case for the, the, the whole of the um, uh, uh, 40, uh, to be 48 um, soon. So we are part of cohort four, so the cohort three and cohort four funding, they are taking that business case to Treasury. Uh, oh. And um, the timing for that is around the autumn of this year. So there will be um, uh, associated funding for those schemes. So we will wait to, to, to hear from them uh, following that. Uh, we have visits from them. Our last one-to-one -one with them was at the end of June. So uh, we are in very close dialogue with them and we work very closely with them uh, to keep moving those on. Um, uh, we also then continue to brief teams, um, uh, our colleagues uh, within HHFT. We have regular briefings with MPs, local councils. Uh, we continue to engage um, with uh, um, our out-of-hospital colleagues. So um, Isabel will be talking to you next. And uh, we know we need to work very closely with our ICS for our next stage, which is public consultation. Uh, and we also uh, work very uh, closely with uh, our, um, patients um, and uh, stakeholder representatives as well in different forums, options development groups, uh, as well as our um, uh, patient staff and stakeholder groups. Um, so we continue to engage and clearly we liaise with Health Watch Ham uh, Hampshire um, and we recently went to present at um, uh, an uh, overview and scrutiny committee. Um, and so uh, the next um, slide talks about um, the engagement. Um, and whilst um, we are progressing the business case, um, I wanted to touch on the wider picture as well. So um, if you could move on from that, please. So the vision that we have um, for our program is broader um, uh, in that um, as a hospital, um, we are an enduring nonprofit organization, which um, I think some people term the anchor institution. So we are in the community and we remain part of the community um, uh, for a very, very long time and therefore contribute to uh, a number of these areas. Um, so the um, new hospital program and the treasury are really interested in these aspects as well uh, and, and not solely the business case. So social value is something that is of interest. And what do we mean by, they, by this? It's how we add value to our local community. Um, so we do this in a number of ways. We do that now. Um, it's just that the new hospital program uh, offers us an opportunity to magnify what we do. So we um, contribute by spreading good ideas, by reducing inequalities, um, by working with local authorities, by working with voluntary and community social enterprises, building links with education, with schools, um, and, uh, you know, we would like to do a lot more as we progress with this project with our schools and colleges, because uh, they could be uh, the people who will be uh, working with and for us in the future and using uh, uh, services in the hospital and out of hospital. Uh, and we want to engage with them as well about um, health, healthy behaviors, um, because we know that um, this is a program. Uh, that will have a legacy for decades to come. Economic value includes uh, being an employer, um, but also um, how can we um, purchase more locally? How can we share spaces um, to support communities? Uh, and as uh, Alex mentioned earlier, uh, we now have, um, uh, we bring you know, primary care to us, our, our um, hospitals, but also, um, our partners are bringing health into high street. So uh, we've got um, facilities at the Chantry Centre and Festival Place um, where there are health hubs that actually enable people to access these services more easily. Um, and um, we went to visit uh, such a centre in, in Dorset recently in the shopping centre where they had an outpatient assessment centre there. Um, and that brings um, easy access to people, but it also brings footfall uh, to city centres as well. So that's, those are some of the economic value that we can add. Uh, the third area is health and well-being of the population. And as uh, Dom has said, we want to look at the um, 
uh, health of our population um, uh, more broadly so that uh, by uh, working with our partners and developing assets in the community, we can support people to start, live and age well. Environmental impact, we have talked through that uh, with our green plan um, being launched as well this year, and we want to reduce our carbon footprint, uh, and we will be looking at more efficient and renewable sources of energy, um, how we construct the materials that we use, our embedded carbon, our operational uh, carbon, our transportation, clean surgery, how we use medical products, uh, nutrition, um, so a number of areas that the new hospital uh, program uh, affords us. Um, and the final area is in uh, innovation. Um, I just wanted to highlight in the next slide um, how we are wanting to develop a healthcare campus that enables um, uh, research, working with academic partners, uh, commercial startups, uh, and voluntary organizations. Um, to um, uh, focus on um, how we can stimulate innovation and also adopt that. And we have a couple of projects there already that you can see uh, with the Space Agency and with NHS Sustainability uh, and being one of the first living labs for them. And we have five uh, universities with uh, centers, expressions of interest letters to want to work with us uh, on that. Um, and we held a, a workshop last year um, and that came uh, around um, because partners really wanted to talk about um, a couple of main themes, which is population and planetary health. Um, and with that vision, I'm going to hand over to Isabel to talk um, through some of our recent progress. Good evening. Um, yes, I'm Isabel Rowe, Transformation Director for the Integrated Care System for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. And um, to answer one of the earlier questions, yes, Hampshire Hospital certainly does collaborate really well with the ICS partners. And I think Hampshire Together programme is a very good example of that. Um, so looking at the, the progress um, we're current, we've been making and going forwards for that programme, we've just concluded a period of um, engagement to develop the proposals as part of the new hospitals programme. And during this period, we've engaged a very, very wide range of representatives, service users, clinicians, local authorities, voluntary sector, health service partners, and so on and so on. Um, and the proposals that are being um, developed include the potential both for service change and major capital investment. Um, and there are two processes for this, and we are busy navigating both of those processes and making sure that we are carefully aligned with the requirements of each. Um, but effectively, the options development's been um, undertaken considering numerous different factors. So the designing clinical models, looking at future demand patterns, identifying potential sites for a new hospital, exploring digital opportunities, assessing benefits, and so on and so on. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, through this engagement, we've generated a very long list of proposals um, from different permutations of those potential clinical models and different estate options. Um, and um, it's quite a convoluted in-depth process and I won't go through it at length, but um, suffice to say, we have followed the best practice methodology of both service change and capital investment. Um, and we have filtered those that long list of options through to a shorter or medium length list, appraised them against the various um, success factors, investment objectives and so on, and reach with the options development group, which is a very wide engagement um, group, um, a set of proposals that we would hope to take to public consultation. And all of this is written up in what is called a pre-consultation business case. Um, so if we can go on to the next um, slide, please. So um, in terms of the things that we're doing now and how we're taking it forward, the pre-consultation business case marks the culmination of that informal period of engagement and the development of the proposals and the seeking 
of permission approval, as it were, to go to um, public consultation on those potential changes. The responsibility for leading the public consultation is within the integrated care board, so the organisation employing the likes of me in the integrated care system, um, and taking over the responsibilities that were the clinical commissioning group previously. But before this, we do have various assurance processes, checks, as you would rightly expect for public consultation or major capital investment. So um, to highlight some of them, the Regional Clinical Senate has reviewed our clinical models as they were described in the draft pre-consultation business case. That's a panel of clinicians from the region representing a range of different areas of expertise who um, both read very thoroughly our documentation and um, interviewed us at length as a as a panel on those models and wrote a report in terms of feedback. Next week, we will um, present to NHS England in which what's called stage two assurance, and that's an assessment of our pre-consultation business case and whether it meets the tests they set for public consultation and also the best practice checklist they'll go through. As Shirlene has already um, mentioned, the new hospitals program is writing a business case at national level, and we are working with them both to understand and influence and feed into that and get as much um, feedback as possible, because the outcome of that business case will then go on to determine the allocation of capital funding that we um, have. We have a provisional allocation, but we need it to be confirmed. And so all of those sorts of things need to be um, covered um, and ready before we can proceed to public consultation. Um, again, in response to an earlier question, yes, we're absolutely working together to get through all of these different hurdles as fast as we possibly can. Um, and we will do so, but rightly, there are a number of checks, the scheme of the nature that we're talking about, so we haven't yet got to that stage of proceeding to the next step. So um, thank you very much. If we go to the next slide, which I think is just a thank you. And then if you, um, any questions, I've tried to cover the ones I know about as we've gone along. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Steve, I'm, in the interest of time, I'm gonna come straight back to you to move us on to our next section, but that doesn't mean anyone we're ignoring your questions. We'll still be answering them in the chat and we'll try and pick them up uh, offline afterwards. And if you look, the colleague of mine there, Laura, has uh, shared how you can be in direct contact with the program at any time. Uh, so, Steve, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Elliot. I just, I, I'm just aware that it's very warm and, and we're running against time. But, Elliot, I'm, I do want to make sure that where people have taken the time to put questions in the chat, we follow them up. Uh, so if you've got further questions, send them on the link. But if you've put a question in the chat, if we don't answer it this evening, we will come back to you. Um, so I'm just going to hand us over now on the last session. This is about designing our nursing future. Um, we've got really, uh, we've got some members of our lovely nursing team on the call here. And Julie Dawes, I think you're going to lead this one off, aren't you? Thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut down a little bit, what I'm going to say, because I'm really keen that we're here from our nursing colleagues on the line. But the point of this presentation now is just to look at the future of nursing and particularly relevant in what we've just heard about Moe's and potential new hospital. I really want to say thank you for inviting us to join tonight. And I'm joined by Becky Parker, who is our consultant midwife, uh, Rebecca Eaton, who's one of our senior healthcare support workers, and Champ uh, Champy Donna, who is uh, one of our matrons. Um, and just really importantly, um, when we talk about nursing and midwifery, um, we also, it's really, really important that we remember our support workers, which is why it's so important we've got Rebecca speaking tonight. None of us um, who are trained nurses know that we could do our job without the support of our support workers. So when I talk about the profession, it is the whole of us. Um, I'd like to just say thank you. Um, I've, I've got an incredibly, um, um, I'm, I'm incredibly privileged to be able to be the professional lead and part of the nursing workforce of HHFT. And um, I have to say, what a fantastic team and they've certainly demonstrated their talents. In order to look forward, I think it's always really important to just take a step and look back at the history of nursing. So the legacy um, of nursing and, and midwifery, it's important to understand the past to, in order to understand the present and the future. Um, and um, there are lots of good things and bad things from the back, but they're all from the past, but they're all very, very relevant. Um, if we start off, um, you know, pre 19th century, the, you may be surprised to hear that the very first nursing school was actually uh, set up in the year 250 BC, believe it or not, in India, um, and it was an all male nursing workforce. 
Um, and you'll see many of the things I talk about this evening are kind of how, how we constantly go around full cycle. Uh, pre 19th century nursing looked very, very different. Um, there was very, very little hospitalization um, of patients. There was very little uh, diagnostics and treatments in those days. And so um, nursing was not considered, in particular the core part, part that we see of nursing, which is caring, was certainly not considered to be a skill or respected. And it was really considered only fit to be carried out for the duties of servants. And I have to say that is an important part when they look at the future because the, the stigma um, and the lack of value, I would say, for the core function of caring is something that the profession constantly has to battle with. But I have to say, I'm pleased to say that it is improving rapidly. In the, in the pre-19th century, there were very little in terms of um, therapeutic intervention. Um, but, you know, there were, there were examples where without technology, without um, uh, high, highly trained nurses, they were still able to continue to do a wide range of duties. Um, it's well known that plants were used for medicinal purposes, digoxin being an obvious one that's always mentioned, for, de derived from foxgloves. But interestingly, uh, in preparation for this, and this is something I didn't know, in the 1950s, nurses were trained to take samples of their patient's urine, dip their fingers in it and taste it to see if it tasted sugary to diagnose diabetes. So I am, as I said, I'm really glad that some things haven't continued through into modern day nursing, not a competence I'd expect today, but a good example, I suppose, of, you know, of the adaptability of the profession. We then moved on into the 1800s where, and everybody would be very familiar with people like Florence Nightingale and Mary Seacole. They particularly took a critical part in the Crimean War with their teams. And I guess there was a really strong foundation there, particularly from Florence Nightingale in setting up, um, you know, she was a social reformer and set up the organization of care. Some things about Florence that perhaps people are not always familiar with. She was a brilliant statistician. She used data, she collected data, she, she analyzed data and she presented it back to inform practice. She also published much of her work. And when we go on and hear about some of our speakers today, we'll see how the importance of that going forward. Um, some other interesting facts from this time, maybe not quite shocking, not so good. Um, everybody will be aware that um, nurses are required to be on the nursing uh, register. So you have to register every year to practice as a nurse with the Nursing and Midwifery Council. In as late, it was as late as 1950 when male nurses were allowed onto the register. And it was as late as 1970 where some nurses were removed from the register. So they lost their registration and were unable to practice for being pregnant outside marriage and for being lesbian or, or homosexual. Shocking today that that was, that was such a little time ago. Um, nurses have, have often played a critical role in wars, civil war, world wars, often played an agnostic role. And I think there are some similarities in the, 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 the war that nurses have played in against COVID-19 in the last three years. And, you know, to many, it has felt like a war, actually. I was going to talk a little bit about that, but I'll just say that for now. It has been, as Alex and others have said, we didn't think last year we'd be sitting here saying, here we are again. And sometimes you can't even remember what wave you're in now. Is it four or five? But every one of those have brought different challenges. And I'm incredibly proud of the way the nurses have responded to that and, and midwives. So moving on to today, what does the nursing look like today? Well, they are a highly skilled, highly trained, highly respected group of uh, multi-professional teams who are increasingly taking leadership roles in health. They are diverse in nature. We've got over um, nurses from over 80 different countries working for us now and a, and a growing number of male nurses in our, in our workforce. The average nurse, and midwife, they are the biggest professional work group in the NHS, but they also deliver the most direct care. So they, these are the professions who seven days a week, 24 hours a day, have the most contact with patients and therefore have the most ability to influence what the patient experience and safe care feels like. An average nurse on a, on a shift, on a shift, 12 hour shift, will, work between, will walk between four and five miles. In this hospital on an average day, we'll deliver 14 babies and care for 30 people at the end of their life. It's a really important part of the community that we welcome lives into the world and we support lives out of the world. 
On one ward alone, we can give over well, over a thousand medications in one day. That's over 60,000 uh, medications administered in a day. And importantly, things like meals, 2,600 meals delivered, of which the majority of those will have some intervention from our nursing workforce to assist with that. Moving to the future, I can move on. So what are our plans for the future? Well, um, Alex has already said we are in a really, really brilliant position to be fully recruited. Um, we want to maintain that. Um, we've got a special relationship, and I know there are some people on the call here from our universities, but particularly Winchester University, who we've worked very closely with and will continue to do so. And I would like to think, and we, we've got early conversations going on about how we might have joint appointments with the universities and really develop that relationship much further. We, I think we will ex ex increasingly see a more diverse workforce and certainly more men it will join us. Um, we will definitely see a really increased use of technology to support our workforce. I had the opportunity to go to a paperless hospital in Milan a couple of years ago. It was amazing to see the risk assessments um, completed online, automatically sent to the equipment library, so the equipment was already at the waiting at the bedside when the patient arrived from ED. Uh, all the medications were prepared and, and digitally administered, um, and I can see us definitely working in that way. We will definitely, I think, start to see more, um, Dominic um, talked about the need for seamless pathways, and I think we'll definitely start to see our nurses working across those pathways and across sectors. There will be about 40% of nurses currently work outside um, hospitals, I think that will increase. Um, and, you know, the parity of STEAM, so how we really make sure that both mental and physical health are provided for by nurses and midwives is as a core part of what they do. The, we will continue to challenge some of the stigmas and the perceptions around nursing, but I think you'll hear from, you'll hear in a moment from my colleagues, and these are brilliant examples of, of how we might do that. So, sorry I've rushed that a little bit, but I do want to give the time to my colleagues to talk. So, I'm going to hand over, first of all, I think, to Becky. Thank you, Becky. Hi, thank you, Julie. Um, and thank you very much for inviting us to speak. I'm just going to talk just for a couple of minutes about um, my role as a consultant midwife and how I got to this position. Um, I've been here at Hampshire Hospitals for the last 18 months, um, and I'm based over all three sites, mainly working out of Winchester. Um, I trained as an adult nurse initially, um, qualified in 2003 and worked as a surgical nurse for several years before doing my postgraduate training to become a midwife, qualifying there in 2007. And then I've worked for the last 15 years in a whole range of different areas as a midwife, doing exactly what you'd expect a midwife to do, looking after women throughout their pregnancies, helping them to birth their babies in lots of different settings and setting them up in their postnatal care. My most recent experience prior to this was as a birth centre coordinator and in that role I got to work alongside a couple of really inspiring consultant midwives uh, and got to see how their consultant midwife role worked. These were two consultant midwives, Jane and Suzanne, who were amongst the first in the country to have this particular role and I really respected the way they were able to focus on women's experiences um, of uh, having their maternity care and uh, you know how they gave birth, how they were able to support women and maternity staff to work together, empower them, um, provide evidence-based information for them and improve outcomes and experience. For me, this was totally inspiring and exactly the kind of job that I knew that I wanted to have. Um, fortunately for me, Health Education England in Wessex are one of the only uh, places in the country that actually offer a training programme where you can become a consultant practitioner. And so um, I was able to do that three year training, rotating around between Southampton and Reading and finally um, ending in Winchester um, before getting my, my uh, full time post within Winchester. And so this is a, sm a slide that just gives you a little bit of a snapshot of what I might do as a consultant midwife. And in my role, I'm part of a, a, a senior team headed by our director of midwifery, Faye, along with our heads of midwifery and um, with one other consultant midwife, Clara. And we work really closely together to try and provide the very best we can for the maternity services. Um, some of my work involves 
uh, clinical care. So I help women who have got complicated birth plans or complex requirements for giving birth to create those plans. Some of those might be surrogate families, some would care outside our recommendations. Um, and so I'm involved with the whole multidisciplinary team in making sure we keep them as safe as possible and support the midwives to care for them. Um, involved in part of the response to the national reports and reviews that we get and we've heard about the CQC report and we've done a, a lot of work as a, as a whole maternity service into responding to that. We provide a lot of evidence for them, we, we learn from our audits and our teaching and share those lessons with our staff to make sure that we're constantly improving. I get to write guidelines and update guidelines to make sure the very best information and national um, practice uh, gets put into our written documents and then try to encourage people to follow those pathways and and give that care to the women um, that we are that we're looking after uh, lots of service improvements over the last 18 months since i've been here we've been able to focus on hearing from women through our, our interactions with our maternity voice partnership user groups and in providing them information on our website through social media um, creating um, in, information about birth statistics that we can share with our with our service users we are introducing postnatal contraception onto our wards uh, we've introduced screening programs for health de uh, heart defects in babies that we've rolled out across all of our sites. Um, I'm also continuing to do a PhD, which was part of the training and is an important part of the consultant role, and that's supported alongside my consultant midwife role. And I'm looking at midwives' experiences of managing birth emergencies in community settings. Uh, consultant midwives also have a really valuable role to play in um, education, so we are regularly in part of our mandatory training and in all of our study sessions and incident outcomes and learning, putting into practice, uh, in making, helping other people to put into practice the learning from those things by teaching and explaining them for them. We work regionally with our colleagues across the whole of Wessex and in our local maternity and neonatal system, sharing best practice about um, guidelines and uh, training sessions. We've worked regionally with the COVID vaccination team um, to make sure that maternity um, users are well aware of what they ought to be uh, advised and providing webinars for them. And we've even worked internationally recently, part of the maternity team, um, including myself, have done some teaching to our Indian colleagues um, around fetal monitoring. Um, there's so many different bits and pieces that a day can be really interesting and, and it can really have a, a beneficial effect on so many different areas of the service. Um, and for me, the job enables me to just listen to women directly, to hear what they need um, from us to keep them safe and to give them a really positive and good experience. Um, and I'm really fortunate that I found a, a role that I love um, working in an organization that um, really respects it. It's been a wonderful first post for me. Thank you. Julia, you're on mute, I'm afraid. So now we're just going to move on to Rebecca and Rebecca, I think is just going to talk to us this evening. She's there. Sorry. <laughs> As you can tell, I don't do this very often. So my name's Rebecca Eaton. Um, I'm a senior healthcare support worker at Basingstoke Hospital. Um, thank you so much for inviting me today, Julie. It really is a pleasure to be here and just tell you a bit about my story. So I've worked in the NHS for 20 years next year. Um, and in HHFT for six years um, and I decided to change uh, careers. Um, I used to be a nursery nurse um, in a nursery in Reading um, and I looked after children for um, people who worked at the hospital, so for nurses and doctors um, and I looked after their children. Um, I decided to have a career change um, when I moved to Basingstoke and uh, came to one of Hampshire Hospital's uh, carers day. So it's a healthcare assistant day. So uh, there's a lot of people there. You, you apply to come to get an invitation. You have interviews um, and I got the job a couple of days later. 
and was told that um, I was going to work on the isolation ward at Basingstoke Hospital, which is where I am six years later. Um, a year after that, I um, was promoted to senior healthcare assistant. Um, the support from my management team was amazing. Um, I've gained lots of skills since I've, I've been here. I can take bloods from patients. I can do cannulation. Um, lots and lots of day-to-day -day looking after patients, which I was, I think I was born to care. And at first it was for children and now it's for adults. Um, and I absolutely love my job, um, as do all the health cares that I speak to. We've got such a good team here um, and everybody works so hard. Um, it's, it's a really nice place to work. Um, I think I get asked this question all the time when I'm going to do my training to be a nurse. Um, and one day I will. I do have two young children at the moment um, that take a lot of my time. But um, I am really excited to do it. And I, I do really have the support of, of my management team um, to take that on. Um, we do exciting things on the isolation ward. Um, it's infectious diseases. So obviously, we've just come through a, a long few years of COVID. Um, and we've all learned a lot. Um, and uh, going forward, we now know a lot. So we're doing our best to keep everybody safe and to get the patients where they want to be. And that's at home. As much as they say they they really like our hospital, they want to be at home and we want to get them there. So we we care for them the best we can. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. R really good and such such a, an energetic. Uh, well, I know you're an energetic person anyway, but <laughs> such an energetic um, account of your time here. So thank you. You're um, welcome. And then last but not least, we're going to move on to Champe. Champe. Hello, good evening. My name is Champe Cardona. I have, I am a clinical matron here at in, uh, Hampshire Hospital. Um, it is great privilege to be here tonight with you all. Thank you for having me here tonight. And the, I am going to share a bit of about my story as a nurse. As you uh, can see in this slide, you can see a bit of um, some of my milestones. Um, so I trained as a nurse in Sri Lanka. After 15 years uh, of working in Sri Lanka, I wanted to move over here to UK to gain some extra uh, nursing experience. So I originally, I joined um, private sector, then to the NHS. Uh, initially, when I joined the NHS, I found it a bit of challenges because the systems we uh, use here is different to back home and the processes are different and also cultural differences. However, I always try to do my best by giving my 100% to what I do. So at the same time, I um, continue to learn uh, personally and professionally to develop so I can uh, um, add those skills to patient's care. Um, by doing that, a few years later, I was able to move into a senior sister role in my previous trust. When I was a senior sister, I was running two departments as a senior sister. Then I felt actually I could a little bit more. So I thought I wanted to gain extra qualification if I want to move on. So I did MBA with, uh, with, with the middle of pandemic. Actually, I, I was so um, proud those uh, time, even though it's challenging, I was able to um, win two awards. One of them was actually a national award. Following that, um, I was able, and I was lucky enough to join the uh, Hampshire hospitals as a um, clinical matron. I have been here now 11 months. So far, my be, uh, journey has been amazing. I want to say everyone was welcoming from the day one. And I love the way we all work here as a team together for the same purpose. We all wanted to give um, outstanding care to our patients. And we all are diverse, and but we are all inclusive. And also we um, 
value our people and uh, we uh, we recognize them their values and then the i um, I have worked in, in other trusts uh, and a couple of other uh, private sector. I can see here most importantly, our vote to the board level, there is no gap. We all work as the uh, same page. We all as a work as a team. So, um, and we have different um, diverse group of people working with us. The nurses are coming from all over the world. Most importantly, they are bringing diverse skills to uh, our teams that is so important to provide best uh, possible care to our patients and i always promote um, diverse um, diversity within my teams and then it is i believe i have privilege and i am so proud i um, i can role model them and i can support them to develop within their journey um, i believe um, what drive me uh, drive me the most is I put patients first. Um, I value my team and the team around me, and then I always want to learn and do more. Uh, I think that's what uh, valued me, and then that helped me to be who I am today. And then that is me and my story. I thank you for uh, listening. Thank you. Thanks, Champagne. And. Could I just finish by just saying one thing throughout? I talked a little bit about going nursing through the ages and, you know, um, from start to finish, the, there are some things that are just just constant throughout, no matter what the time and age country where you are. And that is the importance of touch, the importance of listening, the understanding um, of holding hands and when when to do that, you know, when to do it authentically, when to do it in a non-intrusive way. And there are some of those things that we often get referred to as basics, but there's actually nothing basic about them. They're absolutely fundamental to the core of what being a nurse or a midwife is. And I just want to say that throughout the ages, there are some things and into the future that no matter what the technology brings and what the changes are, there are those core things that just will not change. And they are, I think I can speak from every single nurse in HHFT, it's important that we continue to value and recognize that. And I think you've heard some of that tonight. So thank you. Thanks, Judy. Um, and uh, thanks to Becky, Rebecca and Champney. Um, I think we've come to the end of the AGM now. Um, so first of all, can I just say thank you to all of the presenters who presented the, this evening. We tried to cram a lot in, as you can see. Hopefully it, has a, it was a wide variety of stuff in there. And of course, we had the review of last year. So thank you to all of our presenters. For some of them who haven't done this very often, Rebecca, uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's not as easy as it looks sometimes, is it? So thank you to all the presenters. Um, Elliot's put a note in the chat about questions. If we weren't able to get to your questions, and I'm sorry, you know, we are slightly time constrained, then we will, if you get in touch with the communications uh, team, then we will get, give you the opportunity to ask those questions. Um, and those of you who already got in contact, then uh, we'll respond accordingly. I just wanted to finish by saying just a couple of things about, uh, you've heard today, you've heard this evening about how much pressure the trust is under, in fact, how much pressure the NHS is under. For me as the chairman, it's an absolute privilege to work with all of our staff because it's them on a day-to-day -day basis that make the difference to patients. It's them on a day-to-day -day basis, as Julie's just said, that provide that compassion and support and care for all of our patients. Uh, and that's so important and it's a privilege to work with them all. Uh, and I'd just like to finish by saying that as long as we've got people like Becky, Rebecca and Champy around, and I know this organisation will be in safe hands. So thank you for coming this evening. I hope you found it all useful. Thank you to all of our board members and governors who are here. Uh, lovely to see our uh, previous governors here as well. And enjoy the rest of your evening.